guess I can start with the I I uh, I I was talking to my father last night and um, I told him what topic I was I was uh, going to to speak on uh, artificial intelligence and his idea for the title of this talk was. Uh, artificial intelligence is better than none. Um, <laughs> I really thought about <laughs> including that, <laughs> but I, deci I decided to go with these hashtags, uh, especially AI uh, lib, just because I think, uh, you know, we're, we're all, as a group, we're smarter than, than any, any individual person, and I know there's probably things that you know that can be shared on that hashtag. Um, that could be useful for other people. So um, we can make this a combined uh, presentation. All of us are doing it together. Um, so I'm, I'm Chris Erdman. I work at the uh, NCSU Libraries. I just joined uh, about a year or so ago. Um, I'm a chief strategist for research collaboration. Um, and so I, I have an interest in, in uh, artificial intelligence and how we wor we're working with our research community. Um, to start, I, uh, I s so it's, it's not intimidating at all to talk about artificial intelligence in such a short amount of time, but I have the easy task of doing a little bit of background for all of you. Uh, and one of the things I, I, I found, I, I, I come across things on Quora often, but this quote from Monica Anderson, but to make computers easily do all that which comes easy to humans as a definition for, for artificial intelligence, I thought it was a pretty uh, simple explanation. There's Online, you can uh, go to uh, this, uh, what is AI <laughs> for people in a hurry? I thought it was pretty, uh, like, con style way of demonstrating um, all the different aspects of AI, which is really an umbrella for all the different things that you must, must have heard some of these grab bag of terms. Um, but, uh, you know, he really cen centers this explanation of AI uh, uh, around uh, uh, people. Um, but really, uh, um, AI's been around for a while. Um, it's nothing new. If you talk to CS people, they'll kind of roll their eyes. I think they'll, why are you interested in it now? Um, and I think the reason why we're so interested in it now is that, that high performance computing power is readily available. It's, it's, uh, um, there's, there's more and more data to train uh, these, a a these, are, these AI systems. Uh, there's democratization of AI skills, so you see a lot of uh, training online, uh, even on YouTube for uh, learning AI in, in a day or whatever, you know, like whatever they're uh, pitching. And then uh, proliferation of AI products and solutions. Um, there's a lot of the platforms that are being used now to conduct AI. Um, and, you know, just again, going back to that, let's use an example to explain AI. I think a, a really good one that recently came out was this quick draw which looked for patterns uh, in how people draw um, doodles. And, it, and it, was, it was done on the Google platform, and they were able to uh, just collect this massive data set to train uh, their models on um, with a system you probably have heard of, TensorFlow. Um, but you know, they, Google was able to leverage all this data and, and able to uh, um, come up with a predictive algorithm uh, to 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 really understand what people were about to draw before they even finished it. Another example that was in the news recently is uh, um, Kepler. Uh, the telescope, space telescope, will have an announcement on Thursday that they found they potentially found something in their data set using machine learning. Uh, so um, really, it's being used more and more in the library context. Uh, we so at at NC State, and I'm sure every one of the other libraries out there, we're not unique uh, um, in the sense that we're turning to our collections and thinking about how can we implement some of these, a, you know, AI approaches. Uh, so this is, I'm thankful for these for this group that um, put out this uh, um, uh, really a, a blog post on how they use different tools out there like Clarify.ai to uh, some of the Google and uh, um, and Microsoft uh, um, computer vision um, services. But uh, as you can see, this is a great example of, hey, the algor algorithm got that person, that individual right, but he's not holding a laptop, and that's not a pizza in, the, in, that, one, in that one abstract painting. And so that, that really emphasizes the fact that as we experiment with these AI solutions, 
uh, the underlying data is trained in, in other, it's trained on other uh, data sources. Um, so I, I really wanted to focus my talk on um, our spaces and AI. Um, this is something we're particularly proud at, uh, of at NC State. We have amazing spaces. Um, and one, one of the examples that pops up recently is this uh, project called Digital Life Decoded. You may have seen it advertised on Lita. Um, it'll be a presentation tomorrow, uh, a webinar. But uh, really, this is um, a number of our fellows that got together and uh, decided that we needed to really educate our uh, students on uh, how their data was being used, um, you know, how, how machines were sort of interpreting what kind of uh, person they are. And so here are some of the examples that they used, especially the uh, electronic frontier privacy um, tools. The other thing, too, is. Uh, um, uh, I think that was a great example of, of engaging with our community and, and, and really uh, uh, working with them to, uh, to understand the dangers of, of how our data is being used. And here's a pro project that ran in, in New York and, uh, and now London, uh, funded by Mozilla, where people can actually go to stations where they can see how their data is being used. I, I, I think they have physical representations to digital. One of the physical ones is they have volumes of passwords that have been stolen online, printed in volumes. And so, it, and there's a, there's a detox station for all the people that go through this experience saying the same thing. I, I, I need to do better about privacy of my data and, uh, you know, just. So I think as libraries, we can really, um, we really uh, can do things in this space. Um, we have an amazing makerspace at NC State, and uh, um, one of the things that's, uh, that's happening there is that some of the students are doing projects with uh, um, some, some of these AI services like Watson. Um, but recently, we've also come across this do-it-yourself artificial intelligence kit, and some of the ideas coming out of there are, are, are amazing, sort of uh, a voice uh, recognition system for working with our book bot. Or, um, you know, capturing surveys and, and transcribing them into, you know, so that people don't have to input in anymore if they, you have handwritten ones. So uh, we're, we're going to experiment with this. I think it's a great project. There are more kits to come that Google uh, uh, is sharing. We have a research computing series that we started not too long ago. And, and some of the things that are coming up in there are that uh, um, some of the researchers are interested in, in and um, understanding how they can implement their AI approaches on, on our clusters with the GP, GPU computing that we have on campus. This is some of the topics that are coming up uh, in that vein. But one of the things I, I talked to a computer science, com our computer science department at NC, NCSU, and um, they often tell me that they're, that they're short on data ethics, like that their whole shelf is filled with programming books. Mm -hmm. Um, and and all different you know all, all different sort of approaches, but then uh, there's nothing really on their shelves as far as data ethics, and they they admit that they, that this is an area that they need help with. And I my colleague Bonnie Tarahina at Data and Society just showed me uh, um, uh, a post today about how Google needs this help as well. Um, it's some something that CS people come out of school and not, don't really get um, exposure to. And, and, you know, you've seen many of these uh, stories. This is just one of how that underlying data has inherent problems. Uh, um, you know, there's examples of um, this data being taken and that um, in, in some ways being presented to certain communities and, and those communities not uh, um, being served up the same things that, that other communities will, are served up. And so um, this is a place where we really uh, need to help our community uh, be a bridge. Um, and then this is from my, um, this, the university I graduated from, University of Washington, uh, a, a great program that's, uh, um, that's teaching students now um, about calling bullshit, about looking at the underlying data and uh, looking at the models used and, 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 and uh, critically thinking about uh, what is being presented. Oh, we also have a program called Peer Scholars where we work together with our graduate students um, and they come to us with ideas and one, one of the ideas recently was to create um, uh, um, a deep learning, uh, machine learning um, modules on, on DataCamp and so uh, just recently, I don't, I don't think they've been uploaded yet, but we sh uh, the student plans to share those uh, with the libraries on uh, DataCamp which is 
uh, service being used used more and more um, for data scientists and people in AI. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this in, in our previous se session about data science in libraries, um, that this report from more, more Sloan uh, data science environments that really uh, makes the point that uh, their experience of working with librarians and using their spaces that uh, they make the case that librarians are definitely needed in this space, that we are, are excellent for, for bridging some of these big questions. Um, so uh, these are some newsletters that I, I track. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to track this as much as all of you, um, but I really appreciate um, these new newsletters, especially from Laura Norin. Um, and um, I, another one, too, that is uh, called Humane A AI, which really talks about that uh, um, the social side of, of AI um, is, is done by Roya uh, Paxad. Um, and uh, I encourage you to go there and, and, and potentially s sign up for those listservs there. I find them Im immensely valuable. They're, uh, a, a, they're a read. <laughs> but the great thing about these newsletters is they, they paraphrase um, what's happening in the post so you can skim through it and get a general sense. Um, and there's a, a new initiative called Partnership AI. Um, where uh, it's some of the big companies thinking about AI. Um, and they also uh, have at least a Twitter account that you can follow and, and keep up with um, what the big companies are doing as far as uh, um, sharing what they're doing in AI, AI space. Um, and this is, this is someone I know personally, Lynn Cherney. She, she uh, taught in data scientist training for librarians. She's very creative. She's, uh, she's big in the open uh, viz community, the visualization community, and she thinks creatively about how uh, AI is used and, and, and uh, um, I, I appreciate following her for those kind of ideas like uh, using Minecraft to teach uh, in, in this case. Uh, and then just recently there was uh, this conference, uh, NIPS 2017 or NIPS 17. Um, I, I showed this picture because just look at the rock star stadium now for AI and this is, this is what is there's, there's a lot of people in this space now. Uh, one of the impressive things that happened, I mean, there's more work to be done, but um, in this latest round, uh, they had a, a black in AI um, group, and then they had uh, women in AI that was more prominent, and I think that's a good sign. Um, but that's a great resource to, 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 to track and, and see what they're talking about as well and get, um, get a better sense of, uh, of what's happening in this space. Um, so thanks. Um, we move on to all these people help with all these different services. So thanks to them too. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna allow plenty of time for uh, for questions. Yeah, either way, so. it's not full, but it's okay. Okay. My name is Karim Bugida. I'm the dean of libraries of uh, University of Rhode Island. I wanted to talk about AI for a very long time, and I will tell you later uh, why. And um, I was glad that Chris Erdman and, um, and Ruth Pickering agreed to uh, join me today, because it's a very important topic. And everybody's talking about it, so it makes sense that, you know, within our field, library information science, and, and now even data science, that we have to pay attention to it. So. Now, I always show this because um, people confuse Rhode Island with Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> We're not part of New York, okay? <laughs> so, we're the smallest state. Actually, there, w there is a funny meme saying, if everything is big in Texas, does it mean everything is small in Rhode Island? <laughs> so it's not small. We're thinking big too, so that's why we're talking AI. So within the last two years, good things are happening at the library. This is a little bit of context. So I presented on uh, last time CNI uh, New Mexico our initiatives around um, big data and data science, which is under the umbrella of the library. And also uh, previously, a uh, year ago, 
uh, presented our uh, also the maker space and we have two new things happen uh, URI Spark, which is the entrepreneurship and innovation within the university, it's within the library. Data Spark, Data Spark is a new data analytics program that we acquired. It was part of another organization. It's a, uh, it's linked really to Rhode Island and beyond. There are ten people in it, and the newest newest one is uh, we got a new grant around design thinking. This happened just last week. So. This is why we're talking about AI, and here I don't want to define it at all. And same thing when, when Chris presented data science, it's a whole spectrum. And it's normal that it's work in progress. And there's something what we call the AI effect, is that when a technology is mature enough, it's no longer called a AI. In fact, like OCR, optical character recognition, is no longer AI. A speech recognition, and actually one of the leaders actually in AI now came from the speech recognition and signal processing field. So whatever it means, you know it's important, you need to pay attention to it. The same thing, what is data science? And that's back to your presentation an hour earlier. And by the way, NSF is funding what is scholarship in data science, and actually Columbia and Brown got a piece of it which means that it's really, really work in progress. And that's fine because we, as in the library, archives, and museum field, we're not good in handling ambiguity. So we want things to be totally defined and structured. And, and, and we have to get away from that, like thinking, okay, it's okay, it's a new bandwagon, you think about it, what, scope it, and be agile on it. So this is why it's okay because sometimes we, we did this field, you have, everyone is talking about it. And you say, okay, is this really AI or not? It's okay, but you know it's important. So, Time Magazine specific edition, New Yorker too, and it's around robotics and the impact on robotics, on humans. Popular Science, The Economist. This is, it was out last week. This is why, why we're thinking about AI, not just in the library, but the campus and, and, and nationwide, is because of what's going on in this field. The student literally, there's another slide, I'll show it later. Our student literally, before entering, they have a, a wish list of what kind of classes they want, and AI was a top 10 request. So this is why we, we see in the library as kind of a hub, an intermediary, say, not a neutral space, not at all, because we're not neutral at all. But look at this, the top one, top jobs nationwide. It's huge, data scientists. So this is, this is a regular job, customer success, big data developers too. So we need to prepare the new generation. That's the reason why I want AI in the library, 2002. Do you remember this movie? It was in Newark Public Library, and this is a holographic <laughs> librarian. <laughs> and basically, he was a reference library. And, and later in the movie, the whole library disappeared. What's left is only this guy. So he, he kind of was answering any question. So this was kind of you know, the impetus to, um, to think about it. I mean, technology was not ready back then. This is nude. It was, uh, the trailer was out last week. Why I'm showing you this? Because literally in the trailer, it's all about the library in Cincinnati, the movie, it's happening. There's a new movie by Estefan. Uh, and it says the library is the last bastion of democracy. The police, because the part of the, tr um, the story is that it's occupied by homeless. And then the librarians were stuck between the homeless and the administration. What's the role of the library here? The same thing. So it's important for us because we have a social mission. So whether AI or not, we are part of the democracy of the social system. And values, Becky and Cliff Lynch mentioned it earlier, and many of you, 
that our values are the same. AI now is more on like the technology side and uh, Chris mentioned those, the ethics side, it, it's missing. And we, we need our voice, we need to represent the communities around that. <coughs> so I mentioned that already. This is our neighbor, Brown University. Just basically in November 7, that they're struggling to keep up with, with the training and, um, and curriculum. Literally, like the CS classes used to be like 16, 17, now it's more, more than 100. So there is a huge demand. And the market, we, we heard it from Rhode Island employers. They want folks with AI. So what you should do about it? What's the role of the library? We're not just like waiting to be in a passive mode. So we have to do something about it. So a little bit of history. Uh, do you remember this? I mean, it was 2014. Um, the reason I'm showing this is because when they asked the head of the library, Westport, Connecticut, why are you having those small robots in the library? They said it's the same when early 80s, we had computers in the library because the library was the only ones. So it's part of that movement. And do you remember also, it was in the news, February 2016, Yuke, the robot librarian, so, and actually there was a session at uh, computer libraries in, in last March where they're talking about this too. So this is specifically they designed um, in, um, in UK a robot that will tell you where to find, where to find things. So that's, that's a very interesting. And then I'm citing here uh, Chris, and Chris is here. Hey, I'm citing you because this is really, really important. Like, uh, AI can magnify existing system of inequality and racism, sexism, homophobia, and the like. This is why natural is, um, I would say, we're the voice of the voiceless and the voice of reason because the US specifically is a very capitalist society. So AI is gonna happen whether you like it or not, and it's happening already. So you have to have um, kind of control, and part of it is also as university, we need to train also the student. You have a voice, you have a role, even if you work in companies where the motive is basically making money, but you have a voice in making kind of uh, some, embed some values in it. This was just last Friday. I was pleased when I saw it. So, if, I don't know whether actually Amazon is aware of this or just one programmer decide to make it, but when you ask us about Black Lives Matter, so Amazon, Al Alexa, and Echo, they have a response and a feminist response. That's interesting. And actually the whole, um, um, I would say racist and neo-Nazi are freaking out about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and they need to freak out because it's not neutral at all. And I'm glad there's already something that shows you this. So there was something also Ruth you presented at this event too, uh, around AI. Means now it's, it's, it's no longer really the cutting edge, it's almost it's going to be mainstream at some point. So now us, you or I. So we start the process uh, in March. Um, start talking to internally with, uh, with some faculty, some librarians, <coughs> and also some administrators. How about if we apply for a grant to get, to get AI Lab in the library? And there was a good, um, good response, uh, like uh, people were, were really ready for it. So we applied in June, and we got it recently. So we got the grant to have an AI Lab in the library. And I believe this is the first um, in the US to have literally a dedicated lab lab uh, inside the library. So this is the team. So it's, it's really diverse, as you can see. So we have Kunal from Department of Electrical, Computer, and Biomedical Engineering. We have Sheryl Foster from Department of Philosophies because of the importance of ethics. Uh, John Peckham, Computer Science. 
And also she has another role within the library as in charge of data science and the big data collaborative. Harrison Decker, <coughs> data librarian for uh, with us, your li libraries. Angel Feria is the manager of the makerspace and myself. So this is the, the team that, um, it's the same thing. This is an old ethical dilemma that uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to face, and especially now with the driverless cars. This is basic, basic rendering of, uh, of, of, of the lab. So we have, we repurpose it two rooms in the library, and it's initially around, uh, I would say, demystifying the concept. And it's not, a, it's not research oriented because the Champlain Foundation is very educational. So they want it really hands on and prepare undergrad and grad for the new world. So, so we have a bunch of toys, robots and, and so forth. Uh, maybe we're gonna get some drones too. And we have few stations. Those are stations with GPUs and um, kind of space where you can have a conversation like around uh, whether it's a seminar or a one to one consultation. And this is a basically the, the idea we come up with. So we have zones. So the first zone is you have workstation. And if you can, if you notice here, it's a premium space. You can see it when you enter the library. Literally, you can see it. And it's heavily, heavily used by the <coughs> student. So we want them to be kind of exposed to it, be intrigued, and, and ask. So those are the two rooms next to it. So, and we have also this kind of, you know, the, the level uh, for beginner, um, medium, and uh, advanced. And we have the first zone, workstations. And second zone, hands-on project. Zone three, the half for collaborative thinking. And um, also, this is also for kind of debriefing and also uh, for, for, for staff. So that's basically, it's, it's not a big, big room. I mean, it's uh, 600 square feet. But we prefer this room because of, of the location. So it's, it's very important. Those are, uh, for now, I mean, um, we want to have NVIDIA initially, but NVIDIA has been changing the spec and they said we're not ready to release it yet, so we may change our mind whether we want to go with Lambda or not. And the rest is, is uh, very familiar. And the Professor Kunal is also the expert in terms of IoT. This is why we have to add uh, the Internet of Things in it too. Those are the computer, the robots, and that's it. <laughs>